Most people don't even think twice before posting a photo or a memory on social media. It's the 21st century and social media has taken over the lives of everyone. Although it's a great way to keep in touch with tons of people very quickly, you never know what evils may be lurking behind the shadowy gray areas of social media. Celeste Mono, a thriving girl with a seemingly perfect life, had no idea that someone, a stranger, was obsessed with her to the point where she was being mercilessly stalked. Celeste never even imagined in her wildest dreams that she would be attacked in her own home, but she was about to witness just how nightmarish an obsession can really get. Celeste Mano was born on November 22, 1996 in Italy and had an older half-brother, Jaden, and a younger brother, Alessandro. When Celeste was still young, her family moved to Melbourne, Australia, where Celeste graduated high school and attended RMIT University in 2015, where she studied criminology and psychology. Celeste had dreams of becoming a psychologist and wanted to help people by understanding what went on in the complex human brain. After she graduated college, she worked at a call center called Serco in Mill Park, Melbourne, and Celeste was amazing at her job, so much so that she climbed up the ranks and soon found herself promoted to the position of team leader. She also met a guy, Chris Risdale, at her workplace, and the two began dating. Celeste was defined as the epitome of kindness. She was a beautiful girl with a bright future ahead of her. She loved to dance and was even a cheerleader in her high school. Chris, Celeste's boyfriend, adored her and her personality. He defined Celeste as a treasure and that he was really lucky for her to have chosen him to be her significant other. Celeste was also super close with her family. She and her brothers got along amazingly, and Celeste was very close with her mother, Aggie. She lived with her mother after graduation in Mernda, where the rest of this case takes place. Aggie and Celeste had the perfect mother-daughter relationship, and Celeste almost always shared everything with Aggie. Celeste and Aggie also had a nighttime ritual in which Aggie would always tuck Celeste in before bed, and they would talk about their days before calling it a night. Their bond was just so heartwarming because no matter her age, Celeste always turned to her mother for advice and comfort. Overall, Celeste was a young woman who had a lot to explore, look forward to, and experience. But things wouldn't be the same for long and Celeste would meet her tragic end just days before her 24th birthday. And that too in her own home, a place that most people assume is safe no matter what. Before we keep going with today's case, just a quick reminder that if you subscribe to the channel, you'll be able to see all my latest videos the moment they upload. It's totally free and really helps keep the channel growing, so I'd really appreciate it. But anyway, on November 14th, 2020, Celeste and Chris went on a brunch date in a rooftop bar in Melbourne where they took lots of pictures. Since the COVID-19 lockdown restrictions were finally easing, Celeste and Chris could finally meet each other and have a little brunch and catch up. Celeste had also decided to finally make her relationship with Chris official on social media, with a very happy and heartwarming picture. Both Celeste and Chris were serious about each other, and it was about time that they made things official everywhere. Fast forward to November 15, 2020, which was a Sunday. Celeste posted the photo of her and Chris on her Instagram, then spent the rest of the day watching a movie. Celeste was also in the midst of making plans for her upcoming 24th birthday with her mother. As nighttime rolled around, Celeste and Aggie went about their normal nightly ritual, and Aggie told Celeste that she loved her, to which Celeste responded, I love you more, good night. Tragically, this was the last time Aggie would ever tell her daughter good night because at around 4.10 a.m. on November 16th, 2020, Aggie woke up to the sound of glass shattering. She got up and ran straight to Celeste's room because the sound clearly came from her bedroom. When she stopped in front of Celeste's bedroom door, she saw the most horrifying scene a mother could ever witness. 23-year-old Celeste lay on her bed, motionless and covered in blood. Celeste's bedroom window was smashed and there was glass covering the floor. Aggie couldn't believe her eyes. Just hours before, Celeste was alive and talking to her, and now Aggie was holding Celeste close to her, begging for her to open her eyes and say something. A mother should never have to see her daughter like that, and it's a burden that no one should have to bear, let alone a parent. The emergency services were immediately called, and when they arrived, they were horrified to see how Celeste's room looked. It was a gruesome scene. 
A distraught Aggie begged the first responders to save her daughter's life, but sadly Celeste had already passed away. When Aggie was struck with the news that Celeste was truly gone, she finally understood the gravity of the horrendous situation, and in a mix of sheer hysteria and rage, she stated, he killed her. This statement immediately called the police's attention, and they wanted to inquire more while Celeste's body was taken for an autopsy. It was later revealed that Celeste had been attacked 23 times with a knife, and it was a fierce attack, resulting in a lot of defensive wounds on her body, specifically her arms and forearms. The fact that such a crime could take place in such a tiny window of time, it's just appalling. This all unfolded within a few seconds that it took Aggie to leave her bedroom and make her way to Celeste's room. And their house wasn't that big, so it didn't take her long at all. Her chest, arms, and stomach were covered in wounds. According to police, the attack must have lasted for about two minutes. And now, they're the professionals, so by all means, believe them over the opinion of someone like me. I'm just some guy on the internet. But the fact that this crime took even two minutes seems nonsensical to me. Like I said a moment ago, Aggie jumped into action the second she heard the glass break in Celeste's room. And it doesn't take two minutes to jump from one room to another. In my mind, I see no way this could have lasted more than a few seconds. And it just shows how rage-filled and frantic this perpetrator must have been. It's just so hard to wrap your head around the fact that Celeste was viciously attacked and lost her life in such a short period of time. That too in her own bedroom and just a couple of doors down from her mother's room. As the police searched for more evidence from Celeste's bedroom, they also asked Aggie about her very bizarre accusation. This was when more information about who he was surfaced and the police were left stunned. The most bizarre and infuriating part out of all of this was the fact that Celeste and Aggie had actually gone to the police several times to report this man, but investigators were of little help. Police got to know about a potential person who wanted Celeste and his obsession that eventually led to him ending her life. And that person was someone Celeste worked with, a 35-year-old man named Louis Seiko. So who was Louis Seiko? And why would he attack Celeste so barbarically? Louis Seiko was born in 1984 in Iraq. His parents were Christian, and he was the oldest of five children. In 1992, Louis's family was granted a humanitarian visa, and the entire family migrated to Australia. Louis was defined as a sweet and caring young boy, but he was also a loner and spent most of his time in his room. When he got to college, that's when Louis's personality started to shift, and he became even more withdrawn. He'd never been in a relationship before and was mostly seen on his own. After graduation, the way had been unemployed for the most part until April of 2018, when he got a job at Serco, the same call center where Celeste worked. In fact, he was in the same team that Celeste led. But up until that point, the way didn't really know about Celeste. But this changed very soon. Turns out the way would only hold this job for a short time. And in June of 2019, he received a notice that he was fired based on performance issues. On his last day of work, Louis was escorted out of the office by none other than Celeste Mano. This was the fateful day when Louis really took notice of Celeste, and he was immediately attracted to her. As they were saying their goodbyes, Celeste shook Louis's hand out of courtesy, wishing him luck for his future. But something really odd happened afterwards. Louis, while still holding her hand, pulled Celeste close and kissed her cheek before walking the other way. This action left Celeste embarrassed and probably pretty uncomfortable she was caught quite off guard, understandably. Afterwards, when she came home, she even filled her mom, Aggie, in about this weird detail. Aggie, thinking nothing of it, pacified Celeste by saying that Louie probably had an innocent crush on her. But in my book, making a physical advance towards someone like that, that's not innocent. A few nice compliments, that's innocent. But Celeste, chalking this incident up to Louie just being a little weird, decided to let it go. But Louie was nowhere near done with Celeste. In fact, this encounter led him to develop a strong, one-sided infatuation with Celeste, and he knew that he wanted to have something more than a professional relationship with her. About a week later, Celeste received a message on Instagram, and it was from Louis. But the contents of the message left Celeste feeling uneasy. They started with somewhat of an innocent tone, with Louis stating that he loved Celeste and that he couldn't eat, sleep, or function at his new job without her. How he thought about her every single day and even asked if Celeste felt the same way about him. 
Celeste initially tried to politely deal with the messages by herself, saying that she appreciated the way's kind words. But she only had professional thoughts about him and wasn't romantically interested in him. She also proceeded to wish him well in his future. Celeste gently rejected the way and blocked him on Instagram. But Lue clearly didn't get the message. Lue's obsession with Celeste reached new heights, and her rejection only added fuel to the fire. Lue made dozens of fake Instagram accounts just to reach out to Celeste and harassed her, all in the name of his quote, love for her. The messages intensified in creepiness, and they even turned sexual at one point. One of Lue's very eerie messages stated, Celeste, if you had my body for a day, what would you do to me? Now, this is just ridiculous and highly inappropriate. Celeste was left with no choice but to sternly answer the way, and she said, quote, Stop contacting me. This is making me very uncomfortable. Please respect my wishes and stop. Even after Celeste blocked every single fake account, the way didn't stop, and his messages and incessant harassment made Celeste very upset and understandably scared. This was noticeable to even people around Celeste, including her mother, Aggie, and Celeste's boyfriend, Chris. They just felt so powerless in the situation. Celeste was uncomfortable and losing sleep over it. She initially thought that Lue would get bored and eventually leave her alone, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case. His obsession took a rageful turn, and in one of his frequent messages from yet another fake account, he said, quote, My impression of you has changed. You're no different to the majority of women. I will devote every ounce of energy I have to climbing up and proving to the world that I am somebody. That's my promise to you, my final contact with you. After six months of seeing her daughter enduring this nonsense, Aggie finally convinced Celeste to file a report against the way. When the woman went to the police station and told officers what was happening, instead of helping a distressed woman who was very clearly scared, they told Celeste that the way hadn't committed a crime, and it was best that they just ignored him. When Celeste said that she'd been ignoring him for the last six months, the police officer advised her to get off social media, as this was the norm, if someone put their life out there for everyone to see. Unfortunately, stalking claims are often taken lightly by the police, and there really aren't any solid laws where constant harassment from a stranger could be penalized. Now, there are obviously some laws in place about this sort of thing, but they're so vague and poorly understood that in the vast majority of cases, police don't bother with harassment cases like this until a crime has actually been committed. But the problem with that is that, more often than not, by the time a crime has been carried out, it's too late. Now, I don't know about you, but in the vast majority of cases, this means that a police presence is more or less useless. Just think about what happened with Trump at his rally in mid-2024. There were not only police present, but also Secret Service stationed every few feet, and we all know how that played out. It doesn't matter if police are present. They can't legally do a whole heck of a lot until a crime has actually been carried out. And love him or hate him, for Trump, that almost meant it was too late for him as well. But anyway, the trip to the police station was futile for Celeste and Aggie, as the officers didn't even make a report or write down Louie's name for future reference. Unfortunately, Celeste had to deal with Louie's vulgar and very derogatory messages for another six months. But things only escalated. Celeste would find Louie's car parked outside her workplace. She received almost 140 messages from Louie from multiple fake accounts, and horrifically, Lue also found out the suburb where Celeste lived by following her home from work one day. And that's a nightmare for anyone who's getting stalked. Celeste, at one point, even confided in a coworker and admitted that Lue's messages were scaring her and that she was sure that Lue was going to take her life. Celeste was legitimately scared for her life at this point, and it was decided that enough was enough. Some serious action needed to be taken against Lue. Celeste and Aggie went to the police station again after another six months. And finally, they met a cooperative police officer who advised the women to file for a personal safety intervention against the way, which they did. Surprisingly, the way tried to contest the order in court, but it was obviously denied. For a month, everything seemed normal for Celeste again, but it was short-lived. On August 15th, 2020, just three months before the horrific attack on Celeste, Louis sent a three-page letter to Celeste, pleading that she take back the intervention order. He assured her that he would move on from her after she withdrew the order and the charges. He even ended his letter with a smiley face, which is just so creepy. 
Now, Luay's action of sending the letter to Celeste was, in fact, a breach of the intervention order itself. And when Celeste let the police know about this, they finally had a reason to act. Because after all this back and forth, Luay had finally committed a crime. Luay was arrested at the end of August 2020 for breaching the safety intervention order. And you would think that everything would be normal again, and Celeste would be safe from this man's harassment. But that wouldn't happen. Oddly, within a day, Luay was released, and this time, he was angry with Celeste. He couldn't believe that Celeste would go this far and have him arrested for contacting her. Luay truly believed that he was entitled to Celeste and that she would be lucky to have him. After his release, Luay's torment of Celeste once again continued with a vengeance. And just after his release, he sent a livid and seemingly final message to Celeste, which stated, I know you rejected me. I get it. I'm like dirt to you. I get it. I know you hate me. I get it. Around the same time, he bought a hammer and a knife from a local supermarket. And for the next three months, Luay went radio silent. Celeste didn't receive any messages from him. But knowing what we know now, he was lurking in the shadows, waiting, biding his time to find the perfect opportunity. Well, he did. And that was the photo that Celeste posted with Chris of their date on the 14th of November. Celeste thought that Luay had finally let his obsession with her go. And she was feeling joyful and free after what felt like an eternity. This was why she went on a date with Chris and even made her relationship with him public. But little did she know that this very photo would trigger Luay, who was still secretly watching her after all this time, waiting to commit the unthinkable. Leading up to the terrible day of November 16th, Luay had apparently figured out which home was Celeste's by peering in the driveway and finding her car parked there and even had her home floor plan mapped out to find where Celeste's bedroom was. Now, how he got a hold of this, we don't really know. But Luay had studied every single photo of Celeste, looking for details of her bedroom so that he knew exactly what her room looked like, which is just so terrifying. He was ready to launch a violent attack on Celeste because, in his mind, if he couldn't have her, no one could. On the 16th of November, at around 4.10 a.m., Luay climbed the side fence of the Mono home and smashed Celeste's bedroom window with a hammer. This was the sound that Aggie woke up to. Luay then proceeded to enter Celeste's bedroom and attacked her at least 23 times in less than two minutes, according to police. Then he left through the same window and fence with traces of blood found on it, leaving Celeste to be discovered by her mother. A neighbor's CCTV camera also caught Luay zipping out of the street around the same time that the paramedics arrived. And after hearing from Aggie about the year-long cyber torment that Celeste went through, the police knew they had to arrest Luay immediately. But they didn't have to, because after attacking Celeste, Luay made a beeline for the police station, showed up with an injured hand, and confessed to the crime while handing Celeste's address to the officer. He stated, she's dead. She's dead. Go have a look. You know what happened. It's your fault. And truer words may never have been spoken. In my eyes, this certainly is the fault of the local police. The way he even tried to coerce the police officer to fire at him so that he could evade the law and essentially pass away with Celeste. But the police cornered him and he was arrested. As soon as Luay was in custody, he was charged. And while searching his phone, the police found out that he was monitoring Celeste closely on Instagram, along with hundreds of screenshots of Celeste and Chris. Not only this, when officers searched the Way's laptop, they found Google searches pertaining to Chris, her boyfriend, the bar where Celeste and Chris had their date, and investigators even found Celeste's home floor plans, but again, no idea how he got a hold of these. After being arrested, the Way was awaiting trial, which took almost three years to reach completion. This delay was due to the COVID-19 restrictions, but a major part of it was because of Luay. He tried to stretch the trial as much as he could, and he even tried to use the mental health stance as a way to evade the law. He did eventually plead guilty, but he tried everything he could to get away with this crime, pulling out all the stops to either prove himself as insane or completely innocent, even though he had already confessed at this point. The way tried to convince the jury that he was mentally unstable and that he was suffering from an episode of psychosis at the time that he attacked Celeste. On top of it all, he would fire his lawyers right before the trial, pushing the process back even more. 
He even represented himself at times, and he also tried to delay the court proceedings by maintaining that he only attacked Celeste twice, not 23 times, as the coroner stated in the autopsy report. Louis was adamant to prove himself to be mentally unfit, so that he wouldn't get such a harsh sentence, as a result of which a lot of psychiatric evaluations were done on Louis. And one doctor in particular, Dr. Darji, said that Louis suffered from hallucinations and was forced by an imaginary entity called Isha to act like a criminal. But it was also Dr. Darji who issued a warning in court and stated that Louis was likely to reoffend if he ever got out, and that if he gathered sympathy from female prison guards, then things could take a turn for the worse. Ultimately, it was found that Louis was just an egotistical, self-absorbed individual who couldn't bear the thought of being rejected by Celeste and he was actually faking symptoms of mental health issues. You have to be a different level of sick to come up with such an elaborate plan to try to get a lesser sentence for taking the life of an innocent and amazing young woman who didn't even want you. It's just unbelievable. Celeste's family, especially her mother Aggie and her brothers, wanted the way to be sent to prison forever. And the prosecution even stated that the crime was premeditated, given that he bought the weapons three months prior and that the nature of the crime was angry and violent. Louis had every intention to end Celeste's life that night because he saw how happy she was with Chris and that the couple's photo was almost mocking Louis, which was why he lashed out and attacked Celeste, ultimately leading to her tragic demise. After three long years, on February 29th, 2024, Louis Seiko, who is now 39 years old, was sentenced to 36 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Justice Dixon went on to explain that life imprisonment couldn't be warranted in this case because Louis had a rare and extreme personality disorder, and this affected his mental state at the time of the crime. Justice Dixon also went on to emphasize the trauma Celeste's family went through because of Louis. But it's just so appalling to see a man who, mind you, wasn't even remorseful for savagely attacking Celeste get sentenced to what's essentially nothing for the damages he inflicted on a once happy family. He took the rest of this young woman's life, but he only had to pay with a portion of his own. Celeste's family was very obviously devastated with the sentence, as you can expect. Aggie, who came forward with her thoughts after the sentencing, said that the investigators and courts showed Louie mercy, but they showed her daughter none when she contacted the police twice for help. At Celeste's funeral, more than 100 people gathered to bid her farewell. Aggie was completely crestfallen by her daughter's passing, lamenting the fact that she'd never get the chance to see Celeste as a bride or watch her become a mother. According to Aggie, the lack of interest on the police's part is what led Celeste to her death. Celeste's brothers, Jaden and Alessandro, were struck with grief as they had to say goodbye to a gentle and caring soul that was their sister. Celeste's smile is a memory that's imprinted in their minds forever. Aggie, after Louis' sentencing, has been trying hard to petition for the tightening of stalking laws, and she also called for the electronic monitoring of stalking culprits. Aggie firmly believes that if Louis had been monitored and tracked after being served with the intervention order, something could have been done to prevent what happened to Celeste. Aggie is adamant about changing the laws of stalking because that's what she promised Celeste she would do when she was suffering at the hands of Louis' harassment, that she would bring her justice. Celeste's family remembers her every single day. She was taken away at such a young age, and she had so much to look forward to, but her dreams would never come true. Even though Celeste's family is trying to change the narrative on stalking laws while moving on from this tragic and sudden loss, there will always be a vacant hole in their homes, their hearts, and their minds. Almost half of stalking victims don't even report incidents, thinking that nothing can be done about them and that they won't be taken seriously. And this has to change. Stalking is a serious crime, and things can take a detrimental turn if law enforcement agencies don't work to prevent things from escalating before they reach a point of no return. The world needs to be a safe place for everyone, where no one can harass or torment anyone. But this goal seems further and further away with each passing day. Celeste's case was truly a depiction of a woman who tried to do everything to get her stalkers to stop. But because of the indifference of police and taking stalking lightly, it led to devastating consequences. We can only hope that in the future, things change, and that victims of stalking won't be afraid to come forward to report the violence they've been enduring behind closed doors. But the truth of the matter is, 
I just don't know if that day will ever come. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to help support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.